Hello and welcome to Triage, Rapid Legal Lessons for Busy Healthcare Professionals, a podcast created and produced by K&L Gates. Each episode is designed to highlight important developments in health law and analyze the impact on our clients and friends of the firm. We hope you enjoy this podcast. Hello, and welcome to this episode of Triage. My name is Mary Beth Johnston, and I'm a lawyer in the firm's Research Triangle Park office. My practice focuses on healthcare regulatory matters, where I represent primarily hospitals, health systems, and academic medical centers. And I'm Nora Becerra. I'm a lawyer in the firm's Chicago office, and I represent healthcare clients in regulatory and litigation matters, including responding to government investigations and defending False Claims Act lawsuits. In today's episode, we'll provide an overview of recent data surrounding the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on racial and ethnic minority groups in the United States. Although racial health disparities are unfortunately not a novel occurrence, the COVID-19 public health emergency has really highlighted some of the systemic factors that make communities of color particularly vulnerable. These factors include a broad range of cultural and socioeconomic trends that hinder general access to health care, whether it be lack of transportation, lack of child care, limited to no health insurance, cultural differences between patients and providers, or communication and language barriers, All of these factors exacerbate the spread and death toll of the disease. As a first-generation American Latina, I know I personally struggled with several of these factors when advising my family on safety measures at the onset of a pandemic. For many communities of color, a multifamily and multigenerational household is the norm, making social distancing and isolation of vulnerable family members nearly impossible. Add to this participation in industries that are not conducive to work from home, a reliance on public transportation, cultural norms such as greeting friends and family with a kiss on the cheek, and a general distrust of institutions, and you can quickly see how following strict COVID CDC guidelines can be effectively impossible for some communities to implement. The available data to date appears to bear out that reality. In today's episode, we will revisit the concept of social determinants of health through the lens of recent COVID-19 data and make recommendations on steps our listeners can take to have a positive impact on population health outcomes, both during and beyond the COVID-19 health crisis. As Nora mentioned, the study of social health determinants is not new. However, recent data published by the CDC demonstrates the significant role and impact these factors have had during this public health crisis. But before we jump into the numbers, let me explain that social health determinants are defined as conditions in the environments in which people are born, live, learn, work, play, and worship, as well as their age, that affect a wide range of health and quality of life outcomes and risks. Examples of social determinants include availability of resources to meet daily needs, such as safe housing in local food markets, access to educational, economic, and job opportunities, access to healthcare services, quality of education and job training, as well as transportation and public safety issues. Other very significant social determinants of health also include social norms and attitudes, such as discrimination and racism, exposure to crime, violence, and social disorder, socioeconomic conditions like concentrated poverty and its attendant stressful conditions, residential segregation, language and literacy issues, as well as access to technologies such as cell phones, the internet, and social media outlets. Healthcare institutions and policymakers have long understood that social determinants directly impact health. Thanks, Mary Beth. If we start with the early stages of the COVID-19 pandemic, we can all recall that data was scarce as communities grappled with preparation efforts to try to get a handle on the fast developments regarding this disease. But as the data began to emerge, the numbers were startling. For example, early reports here in Chicago showed that African-Americans accounted for more than half of all COVID-19 positive test results and 72% of recorded virus-related deaths, despite only representing 32% of the city's population. Sutter Health, a California-based health system, analyzed over 1,000 confirmed cases of COVID-19 between January and April and found that compared to white patients, African-Americans had 2.7 times the odds of hospitalization. And this was after adjusting for age, sex, comorbidities, and income. Further, as reported by the American Hospital Association, 
Some of its member hospitals were reporting that minority patients are requiring longer lengths of stay and more intensive costly interventions than those required for white patients. In a call to action led by uh, many of the nation's health organizations, the CDC implemented guidelines to collect and report complete disaggregated data by race and ethnicity on infections and deaths, along with sufficient information to understand underlying causes, such as uh, comorbidities, the number of patients by race who required ventilators, oxygen support or intubation, and the number who died in their homes. Fast forward to today, and new federal data reveals that African Americans and Latinos in the U.S. have been three times more likely to contract COVID-19 than white residents, and nearly twice as likely to die from it. Some counties with a majority of African American residents have almost six times the death rate compared to counties that are predominantly white. In my home state of Illinois, Latinos have nearly seven times the rate of COVID-19 cases compared to white residents, and African Americans have the highest death rate. In California, Pacific Islanders face a death rate from COVID-19 that is 2.6 times higher than the rest of the state, while in South Dakota, the rate of COVID-19 among Asian Americans is six times what would be predicted based on their share of the population. Other minority communities are also disproportionately affected, including in New Mexico, where Native American people comprise only 11% of the population, but yet account for more than half of COVID-19 cases. The main takeaway here is that minority groups across the board are being disproportionately impacted, and steps must be taken to address the patterns reflected in this data if we expect to meet the challenge of this crisis. So what are some of the tools and resources that can be employed to help find solutions, at least during this pandemic? According to the National Governors Association, there are a number of ways that state and local governments, along with health care providers, can help. And some of these we've already discussed in this podcast. For instance, one clear aid is the collection and disaggregation of data to track and address disparities in COVID-19 related testing, hospitalization, death, and recovery among different racial and ethnic groups. As of June 2020, most states were reporting some COVID-19 information by race and ethnic background. A number of states are publicly reporting disaggregated data, including reporting cases by zip code or locality. More granular data, of course, helps to target resources to the hardest hit communities. For example, in Maryland, zip code related data revealed that zip codes with the highest numbers of cases were overwhelmingly those with large populations of black Americans and recent immigrants. Specifically, Maryland's Montgomery County, home to three of the top five zip codes in the state for COVID-19 cases, translated its COVID-19 fact sheets and website into the six major languages spoken in the hardest hit zip codes. A second tool includes the creation of health equity response teams and task force or other coordinating bodies to inform COVID-19 policies and direct resources to communities of color. For example, in Michigan, the governor created the Michigan Coronavirus Task Force on Racial Disparities. The 26-member task force consists of leaders across state government and healthcare providers as well as pastors, union representatives, and other leaders from communities impacted by the disease. The task force core goals are decreasing the unique rise of exposure in Black communities and increasing access to healthcare providers in Black and other communities of color. In April, this task force sent letters to each of the state's major healthcare providers asking them to assess whether racial bias existed in their treatment decisions. Moreover, Michigan also created a combination of walk-up and mobile testing sites to meet the needs of residents without cars. The state's mobile units reportedly go into hot spots in southeastern Michigan, which includes Detroit, and provides testing in nursing homes and homeless shelters, as well as neighborhoods with a high likelihood of mass infections. Next, another strategy being utilized includes states and, and healthcare providers partnering with communities of color through community leaders and organizations and collaboratively addressing policies and programming and resources needed in heart hit communities. For instance, in the state of Mississippi, it is using its Head Start programs to disseminate information about COVID-19. In the state of New Mexico, it has partnered with the leadership of the Navajo Nation to help develop field hospitals and 
triage centers on the 27,000 square mile reservation. The state of Tennessee has partnered with Meharry Medical College and a historically black medical school in Nashville to operate several of its testing sites as the state has ramped up its contract tracing efforts. Authorities are also ensuring that phone calls to residents in hard hit communities of color come from trusted community organizations such as Meharry. One final tool I mentioned entails prioritizing communities of color with allocating COVID-19 resources, addressing barriers to testing and care, and employing culturally informed engagement processes. In Illinois, there are plans to use federally qualified health centers on Chicago's south and west sides to expand testing for the uninsured and underinsured to 400 tests per day. In Minnesota, the state is using a statewide testing strategy to test symptomatic people, isolate confirmed cases, and expand contract tracing. The initiative is a partnership between the state, the Mayo Clinic, and the University of Minnesota. So these are just a few strategies and approaches that government and healthcare providers in collaboration are using to try to address the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on minority groups. In conclusion, while social determinants of health are not a new issue, the current crisis has highlighted and magnified the health disparities between ethnic and racial minorities and the general population in this country. It is incumbent on our government and healthcare institutions to seek out opportunities that assuage these critical health gaps. Some of those opportunities, as Mary Beth just discussed, are working with local community organizations to address testing gaps, for example, by taking advantage of mobile testing, telehealth capabilities, and the like in the short term, and increasing resources and access to healthcare in these underserved communities in the long term. Thanks, Nora. Our healthcare and FDA practice will continue to monitor these developments. And thank you again for listening to this episode of Triage on recent developments on the disparate impact of COVID-19 on racial and ethnic minorities. Please don't hesitate to contact us if you have questions. Thanks again for listening to Triage, rapid legal lessons for busy healthcare professionals. New episodes are available for download through iTunes, Google Play, and other podcast applications. By subscribing to Triage, you will receive timely notifications of each new episode. Also, if you have any topics that you would like to hear discussed on Triage, please don't hesitate to email triagesupport at klgates.com. We would love to hear from you.